For athletes, the greatest moments of life are defined by victories in the arena, at the playing field, or on the racetrack. But Christ's defining moment was a cruel death on the cross. For those who believe, that death bought forgiveness of sins. And for that, we must be eternally grateful. Today, we'll begin to experience the horrific price paid for our salvation. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. We're in a series on Christ among other gods, showing why Christ is supreme. Today, Dr. Lutzer begins a message on Christ's extraordinary death. A few years ago, I was at a banquet seated next to a woman who is a popular pastor but whom I knew was into what we call the New Age movement. And so halfway through the meal, I leaned over and I said to her, do you believe that Christ is the only way to God? She said, well, sure. Why do you even ask? I thought to myself, well, I'm going to have to corner this lady somehow. So I took another bite of steak. And a few moments later, I said to her, do you believe that all the religions of the world are equally right? And she said, sure, it doesn't matter whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian. And I said to her, how do you reconcile that? On the one hand, you're saying that Christ is the only way to God, and on the other hand, you're saying it doesn't matter what religion you belong to. And she said, I'm not going to tell you because I want to be your friend. I said, oh, come on, tell me. So I pestered her a little bit, and finally she leaned over and she whispered in my ear, and she said, you must understand that when I preach Christ, I am not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. She said, I am talking about the cosmic Christ who indwells everybody. Do you realize that there are many people who are living who put faith in the wrong Christ today, and they will be lost forever? In fact, Jesus said that the day is coming when there will be many Christs. He said there will be people who say Christ is here and Christ is there. He said, don't believe them because those are the wrong Christ. What is it that the New Age movement is trying to do? It's trying to separate the historical Jesus, Jesus the man, from the cosmic Christ who is impersonal. And if you read their literature, you find out that they believe that Jesus was born a boy, just a man, and then he became the Christ, maybe because he went to India, and there he was imbibed with a guru who taught him meditation. Or maybe it was because he was reincarnated, but he became the Christ. By the way, all such theories are really wrong. They have no basis whatever. And then what they say is, we believe that we have revelations that supersede the Bible. And furthermore, as for the literalness of the Bible, we will reinterpret it in an esoteric way to strip it of all of its literal meaning. What is the New Age movement after anyway? Well, first of all, you have to understand their theory of salvation. In the New Age movement, Eve is to be commended for having disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Eve is to be commended. The serpent is to be commended, which is Satan, because Eve chose enlightenment. If she had not disobeyed God, her eyes would have remained closed. But because she chose enlightenment, rather than there being a fall in the Garden of Eden, there was actually the ascent of mankind in the Garden of Eden. And we're better off because we disobeyed God. Now, you must understand that this explains why in Gnostic literature, as well as in the New Age movement, you have all of this emphasis on the goddess. Why the goddess? It is because it is related to Eve who led us in the right path. Satan, if you please, turns out to be the Redeemer. Now, you can't harmonize a heresy like that with the New Testament unless you have a different Christ, a cosmic, impersonal Christ. And the New Age movement wants a Christ like this because such a Christ does not have flesh. 
Such a Christ does not shed his blood. There are no nail prints in the hands of an impersonal cosmic Christ. Well, today I want to speak on the topic of the death of Christ. You know, of course, that this is the fifth in a series of messages entitled Christ Among Other Gods. And I've been trying to emphasize that there is a ditch between Christianity and all other religions. In fact, I've been trying to say it isn't merely a ditch. It is, as, it is a chasm that is really as wide as the Grand Canyon. And today what I intend to show is that the chasm is not just that wide. It is an infinite chasm between Christianity and all other religious options. What I'd like to do today is to give you six statements regarding what the New Testament says about salvation. Salvation, by the way, is defined as reconciliation with a very personal, holy God. Six statements, six facts, if you will, regarding salvation in the Bible. Are you ready? I know you are. Number one, God planned salvation. God planned it. It says in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. And after mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, you remember, it was the Lord who said to speaking to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed, the seed of Satan, and the seed of the woman, which is Christ, and the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. God plans it right from the beginning. Now I need to pause here. And point out that this means that the God that is represented in this Bible is different from all the other gods of the religions of the world. First of all, he is a personal God. He is a God who can think, feel, choose, 